And I want to say that today, what we're going to talk about is something that is very much alive, very much emerging, very much a lot that is not um, concrete or clear and fully articulated yet. And so there's an opportunity to just enter into our creative stream. And what we're going to be talking about today is sort of in its essence, how do we create the reciprocity relationships that enable regenerative finance to flow at the landscape scale? We're gonna be talking about that very concretely with what is happening in Barichara this week. So I'll be sharing some things that happened and a meeting Penny and I were in on Monday and a meeting I was in last night. And, and if it uh, if it feels appropriate, I'll bring in some of the things that happened at a, a meeting of families in the Waldorf School on Tuesday. Although I didn't put that into the presentation, there's a lot of interesting stuff going on. And then Penny is going to share as part of uh, the presentation part of today, uh, some of the deeper questions and inquiries that need to be held as the inner work that, that makes it possible for regenerative finance to happen. And that's something she actually shared at the R3.0 conference uh, advocacy partners meeting that happened yesterday. And I started sort of stealing her slides from my presentation. And then when she woke up this morning, I was like, Penny, is it okay if I use these slides? And she's like, I can present that part. And so here we are. So we're gonna, you know, we're making it up as we go. Um, very emergent. But the thing that I think is really important is um, we're gonna show you how we have an, sort of a timely need for some pretty significant mobilization of financial resources that will only happen if it happens because we are really good at building reciprocal relationships. And if we're not really good at building reciprocal relationships, it's very unlikely to happen. And so you're going to, I think you'll see that from what we're going to share today. And so um, I think it might be good to just like maybe jump in because then we'll have lots of time for discussion. We'll be a small group. So lots of, lots of exchanges can happen as we go. Tyler said he needs to leave early. I think Penny needs to leave early, which is yet another reason to just, to not do an opening circle, but just jump in. Um, so that we can get to the conversation with its robustness. So with that said, I'm gonna share screen and, and get us started. And so um, the main thing that I want to emphasize today is, here we go, that um, when we think about something like reciprocity and land relationships, we might go to books like Braiding Sweetgrass or the hospicing of modernity or some of these places where there are people that are showing us that indigenous people did this and do this still. That reciprocity is a fundamental part of, in Spanish language, we call it pagamentos, which is where we basically give gifts of gratitude to Pachamama or to mother earth. Um, in other cultures, they, they do it in different ways, but there's this profound depth of wisdom traditions from indigenous cultures being grounded in gratitude and reciprocity. And there are examples all over the place about this. And what we want to show is that we are constructing reciprocity from our sort of non-Indigenous lens because our cultures don't already have it. And so we have to actively and intentionally build it. And so um, this is where I'm going to pass it over to Penny and ask Penny to talk a little bit about some deep questions that we're asking. And Penny, I've got five slides here for you. This one followed by the three questions, followed by a reminder uh, for the example from the design school. So Penny, I'll pass okay. it to you and just tell me when to advance the slides. Okay, great. So so Joe's going to talk a lot more about the reciprocity question after I talk, but I'm just going to bring this up like a little bit to a bigger level and talk about three underlying inquiries that we are holding as we're as we're moving into this process of of birthing the the bioregional funding ecosystems and um so i'm going to just name them here and then i'm going to go through them in more detail with some slides so the first one that joe's already uh introduced is how do we ensure reciprocity of value flow when money is involved um the second question is how do we foster cooperation rather than competition um, within our regenerative work um, in an environment with a scarcity of monetary resources. 
And then how do we address our underlying traumas around money? So you can go to the next slide, Joe. So I'll just say a little bit about this and then um, Joe's gonna say a lot more. Um, but when we think about reciprocity, we can think about the fundamental dynamic of energy of the universe, which is the Taurus. So if you think about energy in a Taurus, it comes in and out uh, or up and out or down and out in all directions and then back into the center. So uh, you can think about yin and yang with that dynamic um, and then giving and receiving. So giving would be the dynamic coming out and receiving coming in. So when there's not reciprocity, not this dynamic of giving and receiving, then the result is stagnation in the flow of that energy. And um, stagnation leads to disease. And ultimately, as one of our friends in Bodhichara, who's worked in war zones, bringing peace building, he says, ultimately, it results in violence. So, so it's really important that we start to think about how do we ensure reciprocity um, in this, in the relationships with, you know, with, within our groups, within our teams, with the funders, the, with the recipients of the funding, uh, the sellers of land, uh, and within the community itself. And Joe's going to talk about this more with an example of what's going on in Bodhichara. Joe, can you go to the next slide? So how do we foster cooperation? Um, so we're currently living within this debt-based system and it, which ensures a scarcity of monetary resources and it fosters competition amongst our efforts that actually need to be cooperating and collaborating. So how do we foster that cooperation at these various scales? Of course, um, within our groups, you know, we talk a lot about pro-social, but then when we start to think about between groups, so between the small regenerative projects, how do we foster cooperation at that scale? And then going up to the next scale when we're working in, at landscape levels like watersheds, for example, restorations of watersheds, how do we foster cooperation among all those stakeholders? Um, and then at the scale of bioregions, when you scale up even, even higher with even more stakeholders, and communities and so forth, and then um, to the planetary scale, which is where we're working in the design school. We're working at the scale between bioregions. How do you foster cooperation between bioregions so they're not competing with each other? Um, okay, uh, this is where I think I'm going to share the example from the design school, Joe. Um, mm -hmm. I also want, there's the third question. Yeah, this is super important. Yeah. So, um, well, maybe I'll go through this slide and then I'll do that example, I'll give that example. So the third question is how do we address our traumas? Uh, this is like at the core of the other two <laughs> questions and the core of really everything. Um, because first and foremost, especially with money, it brings to the surface our survival fears. And um, like when our survival fears are running us, then we all know what happens with that. We kind of go a little crazy. Uh, violence, all kinds of horrible things can happen there. Um, and so we need to address the that. Um, also with privilege, some of us deal with guilt and shame around that. That can be pretty intense. Um, even the possibility of receiving money can trigger like a, an intense fear of the responsibility that that implies. Um, and people can run away from that in all kinds of interesting ways. So, <laughs> yeah, um, we, we have traumas around either giving or receiving around trust. Um, we're in a system that is trauma inducing and we're in a collapse scenario that's trauma inducing continuously over and over and over. And, and so we have to work with this. We have to work with traumas. Um, at the individual level, at the collective level, and then at the systemic level as we're building these systems. So um, now I'm going to talk about uh, a small example of, of mainly around like the cooperation and the trauma angles uh, that we did this little experiment in the design school where we um, 
we had five thousand dollars from the design school fund which you know from membership dues we collected that money and then we put it out and we said to the design school members anybody who's organizing in their bioregions um uh want to come together and have a group process and decide how to allocate this five thousand dollars amongst yourselves so so we had three groups come come forward from the Colorado River Basin, from Cascadia, and then a group from India. And uh, what started to happen right in the beginning was sort of the typical like uh, competition started happening. People started pitching their thing, like here's my thing, and here's what why the Colorado Basin needs it, and here's why Cascadia, and here's why we need it in India, and um, and so what Joe and I did in that situation is we we helped to bring it to the next level up and uh, to the next scale higher to remind them to look at the system level between the bioregions that were in this group so what's happening across the the field of bioregions right now like what's going on in that system and where would the priority be in that system rather than just with your own bioregion and so they started to see, oh, well, the person in India said, actually, we're not even ready. We're not really organized. So I don't think we should get funding here, actually. Oh, and it looks like the Colorado Basin, they're, they're at this critical stage where they need to move to the next level with a retreat. And so we should give more money into that right now. And then a little less to Cascadia that was preparing for an activation a little later down the line. So, so when they scaled up, to that, that higher scale and looked at the bigger system, then they could start to see where the priorities should be amongst the projects. And that competition turned into cooperation. So that's just a, a an example of an experiment and the ways that we're starting to think about how do we how do we foster cooperation and how do we work with the trauma of like that we're so used to competing, you know, and how do we, yeah, how do we work with reciprocity? So that's what Joe is going to move into now in the next part of the presentation. So I'll pass it back to you, Joe. Thank you, Penny. And I'll just add that it was an interesting thing about the part of that experience with India, because the white privilege, the rich people from the North privilege, that guilt and shame about privilege, shaped people to want to give money to a project that wasn't ready. And if the person leading that project had experiences of survival fears, they would have clung to their need for money. And um, and that's not what happened. And so just naming that those dynamics were present and everyone felt really wonderful about the process, including the person that was doing the work in India. They all felt really good about it afterwards because uh, we got really, really constructive feedback from the process. So just naming that there was a lot of learning that we, that we gathered there. So what I want to do now is talk about Tierra Sagrada Barichara, the new nonprofit that we're creating, which I've talked about in some of the previous sessions in this uh, finance lab, where Tierra Sagrada is a Colombian nonprofit. We're now scheduled to have it be legally constituted in November because we've started a deeper community development process to bring more people into the work before we legally constitute. So we've sort of slowed it down to let it go deeper. But one of the things that we did was we started collaborating with the same person that did the work on peace building in war zones, Felipe Medina, who I mention occasionally here. Um, Felipe is now working with Penny and me to facilitate a design process with us to help us design the reciprocity um, patterns for three different webs of relationships related to Tierra Sagrada. And Tierra Sagrada's mission is to bring private land into the commons, for the regeneration of the territory. So just have in mind, like Tierra Sagrada is about land ownership, land management, and cooperation across private uh, land boundaries. And so we saw that we need to develop reciprocity agreements with, with donors, which is what we've already done some of that design work. So I'm gonna share that with you in a moment. We see that we need reciprocity agreements with local landowners and land stewards and people collaborating in local regenerative work. And then we also need reciprocity agreements with members of Tierra Sagrada, because it's going to be a member-based nonprofit, which means that members of the community can join the, the nonprofit as stewards of local projects that are affiliated with this work. And so we need to have reciprocity agreements. Like 
someone becomes a member of Tierra Sagrada, what, what are they looking for to get from it? How is it going to help them? And how do we make it clear that those reciprocity agreements are managed in the most transparent and proactive ways possible to minimize conflict and to ma maximize transformative potential for what we're trying to do? And of course, there are all kinds of reciprocity relationships between these different uh, domains. And so we're going to be exploring all of those throughout the next few months. But what we did to start was we started with the reciprocity relationships with donors. And on Monday of this week, Penny and I sat down for 90 minutes with Felipe, and we had this beautiful discussion that revealed that there are four areas where donors can receive reciprocity. And I'm going to go through those to show you how this works, which is to say, if someone gives money to Bodhichara, we want to be sure that they get something so that the energy flow is harmonious. And so we identified four key ways that Bodhichara offer, offers reciprocity to people. These are related to healing processes. So a donor can receive some kind of healing from Bodhichara. Inspiration, someone can just be inspired by what's happening here and feel good that there are impacts that are happening. There can be a sanctuary. People could actually feel like there's a refuge or a place to come to for sanctuary that could be spiritual, emotional, or physical. And then also that there are learning processes and that people can give money to Bodhichara to receive learning from what we're doing. And we saw these as the four primary ways that people donate money to Bodhichara or that they may donate to Bodhichara. And so let's just go through each of these one at a time. In the realm of healing, people who donate to Bodhichara will be offered a variety of ways that they can seek healing from our territory. Now, I've said many times before, the word Bodhichara is an indigenous word that means a place to rest. The energy of this place, and Tyler knows this because he's been here, if you come to Bodhichara, the energy here is inherently healing. But also Bodhichara has a lot of healers. We have people that do massage therapy, energy healing, uh, plant medicine, ritual and ceremony, um, psychological and social work, peace building work. There's a whole bunch of healing modalities and capacities. Bodhichara is a place that gathers healers. So one of the ideas we have is that specific donors will come to us and we'll ask them, if you're seeking healing, does that mean that you want to come and we help you organize a week of sort of like the, the regenerative spa, if you will, like come here and you'll have, um, you know, sound healing together with walking tours and, and time alone for journaling in nature while getting um, physical therapy and massage or a meditation retreat, or to do yoga with local people. That basically we could create these sort of healing packages for people who donate money and custom build them for them as a way of making explicit the reciprocity that they're receiving. And Bodhichara has a huge healing capacity for people all over the world who may come to Bodhichara to receive that healing. So part of these reciprocity agreements are to explore with our donors whether healing is part of what they're looking for and how we can give them what they need from a healing lens. Now, when we look through the inspiration lens, a lot of people donate money to Bodhichara because it's inherently inspiring, you know, that they can receive simply by knowing that positive regenerative impacts are taking place somewhere in the world. Trees are planted, rivers are restored, different kinds of economic life. We have people donating to, into wholesome models of education because they just feel good to see kids being educated in this way. And so some of our donors simply want to feel that they're making a difference. And this is a big deal all by itself. So inspiration is reciprocity. And we need to make that clear that if someone tells us that they're giving money because they're seeking inspiration, but they actually need healing, then we may have misplaced expectations about our relationship. So we need to explore if healing is part of what they need. And we've also had conflicts in the past with donors, and one donor in particular, who said that they were doing it for inspiration, but they were actually doing it for sanctuary. They were actually had a bunker survivalist mentality, and they destroyed things and did a lot of there's a lot of violence and damage that was done in the community. And so we learned that we need to make explicit that these are different kinds of reciprocity. And so if we look at this from the, the learning lens, a lot of money we receive in Bodhichara is because we have alliances and partnerships. I would include all of you in the design school, right? 
people in the design school learn from what we're doing in our bioregion. And so you're learning right now from what we're doing in Barichara. So they can gather case studies. They can learn process models for regeneration, how to organize at the bioregional scale. They get to see what's happening with education and economics in terms of models and best practices and concrete examples. So donors may want to just learn from this through online learning, or they may want to come to Barichara through programs like there's one a program called Suna Barichara, where someone could come for two months and have a customized experience of working with regenerative projects over the span of two months while being immersed in the community, or through the design immersions that we're starting to organize, or through the different kinds of regenerative work in our territorial foundation. So some of our donors may wanna come for membership or to volunteer in local projects. By the way, Tyler did this, so he could tell you his experiences from 2021, how much, how much you learn from volunteering and being here. And we also have people who donate money to give scholarships to enable other people to come here. We're cultivating a relationship with a company in Germany right now to give money into scholarships for German undergraduate students to participate in SUNA, which costs about $2,000 per month. So they could give a scholarship for a two month immersion for a, a, a student from Germany as an example of a very clear reciprocity relationship. And so when we look at these things of healing, inspiration, and learning, there's another one that's really present for people, which is sanctuary or refuge. It's a sobering truth, right? People around the world feel grief and anxiety about collapse, and they're very aware of the dangerous times that we're in. And some of our donors want to escape the fascism of the United States or Europe, or they feel the food systems or other support systems, the healthcare system of Canada, social support systems that are collapsing around them. And so we recognize that some people want to give money into the acquisition of land, our transition pathways for alternative economic models. They want to do that so that they could move to Bodhichara and live here. So we recognize that this is an important motivation, even though it's a very delicate one, which means <clears throat> we need to make it explicit that if someone is coming, is giving money to Bodhichara, because they are seeking refuge, that we need very clear agreements about what they can and cannot get in reciprocity. Someone can't buy community by giving money, for example, but they might be given free housing in our ecological cabins on community land that we bought with money that they helped bring in. And so these reciprocity relationships around sanctuary are very, very important in the midst of collapse and we're certain that some of our larger donors are going to be thinking about sanctuary as part of the reciprocity they're looking for. So we're like, let's just make that explicit so that we can navigate it in a mutually respectful way between local people and those who might come here to minimize conflict and maximize regenerative potential. And so when we take this, these four ways of thinking, healing, inspiration, learning, and sanctuary, and we look at this land called Las Ruinas, we start to see that we actually have an opportunity to practice right now. Because Las Ruinas is this piece of land right next to the entrance to the Bio Parque. I've talked about it in previous sessions about the ecosystem of learning sites in Barichara. Yesterday, I met with the Junta Directiva, which is the leadership council, for the organization that owns the Bio Parque. I sat with them and we talked about the beautiful vision of territorial scale education, what's happening with the school Sueños del Bosque, and how this piece of land is the perfect long-term home for the school, and then the school becomes part of the Bio Parque. And the, the organization that owns the Bio Parque has some pretty serious problems with a former, former mafia boss, it was like a former mayor of, of Barichara, around 2010 or 2011. This former mayor tried to steal part of the Bio Parque and created um, uh, taxes and fines to cripple the Bio Parque with debt. And so the Bio Parque has been in legal jeopardy since that time because the, the association that owns it can't pay off their taxes. So if we could raise the money to buy this land, we would give them the money to address this debt problem that they have and something we can actually solve permanently because we have a much more progressive minded mayor now. And that would make our school part of the Bio Parque to increase the power of the school. Yesterday, I met with this Junta Directiva and they said that they wanted us to buy that land. So we're gonna practice. 
How do we create a reciprocity agreement with whoever donates money and with this local land steward, the group that we're buying the land from? And then how does it relate to community members? We're gonna practice with all of this because in the next few months, we need to raise $150,000 to buy this piece of land. They actually need $60,000 by December to be able to pay their taxes without having another year, starting in January, they'll have another year of fines for unpaid taxes. So they'd really like to have the money by December. So we're gonna try to raise $150,000 to buy this land. So how will donors receive reciprocity as we raise this $150,000? You see, we're going to practice this question very practically in the next couple of months. But it's actually a bigger story, of course, because we're doing something systemic. So we actually found that to buy this land, Las Ruinas, we don't just need $150,000 to buy the land. We need $50,000 to construct a school on it. Yes, you could actually build a pretty nice school for $50,000 with the local traditional earthen construction practices. So we realized we need $200,000 to both buy this land and to build the schoolhouses, the outdoor classrooms, the infrastructure of the school on that land. And our school needs $75,000 for operating costs next year to pay for our teachers, to pay for our community learning processes, to fund regenerative education work in the community that's related to the school. So we're trying to raise that money at the same time. And we need $25,000 in operational costs for the Bio Parque to pay the maintenance team that's just planting trees and growing the forest there so that the Bio Parque can expand. And then we have the Project Orihandalagua that needs $50,000 to keep doing its work and it's interwoven into our learning ecosystem, which means we could be competing to raise all of these different funds because we actually need $350,000 for our learning ecosystem in the next year. So you could see these four projects, Las Ruinas, Sueños del Bosque, the Bio Parque, and Oriental Agua are four different regenerative projects in the community. They could very easily compete with each other. But if we could raise all of the money in a collaborative way, they could become cooperative and interwoven with each other in service to the territory as a whole. And so we're gonna practice creating this fostering of collaboration between projects raising funding through the Regenerative Education Fund that we've talked about in previous sessions, and building reci reciprocity relationships with donors, land stewards, and community members all at the same time, because we need to raise this money in the next few months. And so it's in that way, of, in that spirit, that I want to move from presentation mode to conversation and say that here we are, this is real world work, you know, beautiful things like our Waldorf school will end and die on the vine if we don't raise money to pay our teachers next year. We have this opportunity to form a really deep long-term partnership with a very important player in our community, the owner of the Bio, the owners of the Bio Parque. And this window of time has given us the time frame and our constraints. What the hell do we do? And so what I want to do now is shift into the into the inquiry mode the kinds of questions Penny was asking. How do we foster cooperation? How do we clarify reciprocal relationships? We know that a lot of this is driven by or made problematic by trauma. How do we understand trauma, have a trauma-informed approach? And how do we move this huge amount of money in a short time? Can we raise $350,000 in the next like three or four months? You see like all of us doing regenerative work, this is how it is. It's like, oh, fuck. <laughs> I thought things were going so great, but they created new challenges. This is just how it works. So um, here we are. I'd love to just have a conversation about this. What does this prompt in you? How could we do this? What do you see that we need to think about? Is there some, do you want to be a part of this? Do you want to help us solve this in practice? I don't know. I'm going to open the floor to whoever wants to share. Um, so welcome and let's talk. Mm. Aleta, please. Hi. The moment you mentioned taxes, I was like, oh, gosh. What came up for me, because we, with land in South Africa, I don't know what the, the you know, jurisdiction type of stuff is in, in Colombia, but we have a land tax that's payable annually. 
um, a bit like a municipal tax and water taxes and so on. So as owners of land, we actually have quite a significant amount of money that we have to fork out just because we actually have the title deed. So my question, when you were saying that you're going to pay that debt, you know, for um, those taxes that are outstanding, was immediately, okay, so how are you going to make provision to be paying those taxes in future? Or will there not be any taxes in future once you've paid that debt? So it's just like, you know, forward thinking, because it's one thing to pay the debt, you know, it's another thing to say, how are you going to pay it in future? So this is one of the beautiful things about Colombia. Colombia has some of the best legal frameworks in the world for sustainable development, even though they're mostly not implemented and they're mostly not enforced. So it's, it's a mixed bag. But in 1992 at the Rio Earth Summit, members of the Colombian government attended. And in 1993, Colombia created a new constitution. And so they incorporated sustainable development from that time into the legal frameworks. And they created a model of private nature reserves, public nature reserves, which is the national parks, and civil society nature reserves, which is basically turning your land into a benefit corporation. You like you identify social and ecological benefits and you don't pay taxes. And so it works in this. And they've had this, this legal framework since 1993 or maybe it was 1994 when their new Ministry of Environment was established. And so what's interesting is Colombia has these kinds of legal frameworks that are really nice. And so the Bio Parque has tried to become a civil society nature reserve, so there'd be no taxes, but it's been embroiled in this unresolved conflict. And so that's one factor. Another factor is that the town of Barichara is a national monument. It's, it's got this patrimonio nacional is what they call it, which, um, which means there are restrictions on the use of land, including the piece of land that we buy but it's enforced locally by the mayor's office. And because we have such a good mayor now and the people that own the Bio Parque have a good relationship with the mayor that I was told last night that the mayor would forgive all, well, basically they would remove all future taxes from the Bio Parque, which is only about 4 million pesos or like a thousand dollars a year. Um, once you get past all the fines, the fines are what has made it so high because um, it's been 10 years of unpaid taxes with fines. Um, that it would actually, that they have a solution with the mayor and with the civil society nature reserve that we could apply for once we've resolved the issue of the taxes. So when I talked to them last night, they said, we got it solved. I was talking to the mayor the other day. If you guys could just buy this land and help us pay off the back taxes, we're good to go. So. And when the mayor gets changed? This is why I think we should still become a civil society nature reserve. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I see it as we would have the collaborative relationships with the association and with the Bio Parque. And mm -hmm. I have been the primary source of money for the Bio Parque for the last five years, mobilizing it through Gitcoin, through fundraising, through people that come here. Like I've paid out of my personal, I've paid out of my pocket for the person who plants trees in the Bio Parque, Don't Jesus. Don't hey, I think I, I've personally paid for two years of his work in the last five years um, because I just bring in money. So we have this really good relationship at the level of managing the Bioparque, really good relationship. Now we've moved up to a good relationship with the association that owns it, which are the most privileged and powerful landowners in the town of Barichara who are from here, the local, local people, the Pati Amarillos is what they call them. And so this is a whole new level of partnership that me as the white guy from the outside, I never had access to. But after five years, Last night for me was a pivotal moment in my relationship to the territory. I can collaborate with the local, local people at the high level of strategy because of this trust around the Bio Parque. So I think we're going to solve all these problems because they're the ones who are friends with the mayor. You know, I don't even have to be. And so mm -hmm. like the, the sort of the old stakeholders of power, the old landowners, they're the ones who donated the land for the Bio Parque. You know, they did that 15 years ago. So it's a really interesting moment for this kind of work. Um, are there other comments or questions, ideas, feelings, thoughts, anything? What's coming up for you? Um, I'm curious, sorry, I'm driving right now. So I'm, I'll make this brief here, but um, I'm curious to know, um, 
how are you identifying donors and like what is your strategy for grants versus um, donations? I guess like that, you know, this push for getting getting this amount before um, the following year. I guess do you have a strategy in place or what is where are you guys at with that? Hmm. Penny, do you want to talk about that one first, or do you want me to? Maybe, maybe you go first this time. Well, I'll just say that all of this just happened. Like this morning, we're like, okay, this is the amount we need. And let's bring it to the regenerative finance group so we can all think about this together. <laughs> like <laughs> Joe can talk about the past and, and how we've done this in the past, but but I feel like this is new and we're we're bringing it to this lab to actually be learning together. But Joe, you can talk about what you're, <laughs> yeah. Well, I wanna name a moment in the history of social media, which is when Twitter became X, when Elon Musk bought Twitter. There, were, there wasn't only that, there were several things because AI was starting to be used before chat G GPT came out. AI kind of stuff was already being used on the back end. The algorithms were already doing terrible things on social media, but really things became much, much worse at the time that Twitter was acquired. Uh, there were things that happened on Facebook, things that happened on Twitter, on LinkedIn, things that happened with paywalls on Substack, like on Discord, like it, it's not platform specific, it's algorithms controlling the planet. And what happened in a nutshell is community organizing went away. I used to be able to go on something like Twitter and gather people for shared purpose. But now anytime I start doing that, the AI algorithms sense it and suppress my content, and they do this for everyone. And so um, because we've been tracking that information ecosystem, we found that we need really different ways of doing fundraising because you can't just do it. With, you cannot do it with social media anymore. Or at least there's some things you can do, but it's it's so much weaker than it was two years ago. And what Penny and I found through our bioregional activation tours is that you know going back to grassroots, almost a door-to-door -door strategy, but in a deeper, meaningful way, this bioregional organizing feels like the way. Like one thing we're gonna talk about in two weeks in Toronto is we wanna create these funding ecosystems for the greater Toronto, for the forest of the Northeast, for Cascadia, for Barichara, et cetera, which means we need to help them to do local organizing for their own funding ecosystems, their own funders. Who's funding them in their own communities? So like one idea that we had that worked for us three years ago was we created something like a donor advised fund informally. We call it the Bodhichara Pledge Community. We asked individual people to give $1,000 to Bodhichara's Ecoversity. This is before the Ecoversity was destroyed by that malicious intent by the donor. Um, and we raised about $40,000 that way. So we had 40 people, 35 people, I think it was, who gave $1,000, but they became a support network Anyone who can afford $1,000 either can give a little more or knows someone who can. So they can, add, you know, on, on modest scales, but trying to raise $25,000 or $50,000, it's a scale that works. So just by building trust and relationships with people at that interpersonal level, I think that we need to do that in all of our bioregions. And so I see that kind of strategy for the level of the design school, for the level of body chara, for the level of the other bioregions. And then also enlightened philanthropists who can shape the field for other philanthropists. So you've heard us talk about the Novo Foundation and how much money they're putting into bioregional regeneration and how they're trying to get other foundations to do it too. But because they're so big, they actually have the problem that other foundations step back and like, oh, Warren Buffett's money is going to fix it all. I'm not doing a damn thing. And just as a little inside scoop on that, um, one of the challenges that happened with the Novo Foundation back between 2012 and 2015 is they put hundreds of millions of dollars into the women's movement to try and stop violence against women and human trafficking and other terrible things. And they had this mimetic problem that they were putting so much money and doing such good work that everyone was like, we don't have to do anything for women. Let Novo take care of it. And there was no movement building that occurred. The amount of money was irrelevant without movement building because all of the other philanthropists saw themselves as trying to create their own niches and they didn't they didn't know how to collaborate. 
And so this question of if you bring too much money too soon, you undermine collaboration through really perverse ways. Like, oh, Dovo's doing such good work for women. We don't have to do a thing. It's like, you wouldn't even think that's going to happen until you saw it happen afterwards. So, so this movement building work is front and center. Um, and I think small family foundations, um, not impact groups, but individual high net worth uh, donors who could leverage other resources, but not competing for and applying for grants because that's just a nightmare and mostly not worth our time. And we're competing with our allies for money and grant, and grant rounds. Um, so you can sort of see the feeling of it and why reciprocity is so important, why we need to think about reciprocity every step of the way. Alada, please. Could you maybe expand on this re reciprocity with these um, individuals with a thousand dollars, you know, where you were getting people to put it in, into a pot? What was the flow exchange of value there for them? I would say because we didn't make it explicit, we didn't actually ask them. So that's one thing to say off the bat. So I will interpret possibly incorrectly but I would interpret that mostly what I saw was a combination of inspiration, learning, and sanctuary, which is that some people were like, I'm inspired, go do your stuff. I don't have time to participate. Some people were like, like one of the donate, one of the donors was Brian and Susan from the Legacy Project. They gave us $2,000 from a grant that they had, which enabled us to start the partnership. And now look at what we've done ever since how much we've done with Brian. What we did with Brian and Susan started with them giving $2,000 to fund a local educator in Bodhichara to work with kids on emotional development. But then we retroactively said, you guys already gave $2,000. Let's just give you two places in the Bodhichara pledge community. And they were leveraging that learning into the GTB work. But then there were some people that were like, I'll give $1,000, I'm gonna watch because maybe I want to sell my house and move there when shit gets really bad in California. And so, so I would say that those things were happening, but we were not clear about any of it. Um, and so what we want to do now is construct that clarity. So that if someone gives us a thousand dollars, maybe they could give us a hundred thousand. And that might actually make sense with the right kind of reciprocity relationship, where it might be that, that they have way too much power because we would give them too much power in the wrong reciprocity relationship. And so this is where the exploration of reciprocity gives us so much more clarity about protocols, offerings, agreements, which we're just starting to really learn about based on our past experience. So I'd say we, we're much yeah. you know, once bitten, twice shy, as it were. We'd be much better at it this time around. <laughs> Penny, please. <laughs> yeah, just to, I guess, just reiterate that point that what we're trying to do now, what's also happening in the community is a process around what did we learn uh, in the process of how everything went wrong with this other donor, right? So it's like uh, now Felipe, who's also helping us with Tierra Sagrada, is also facilitating a process uh, around a, basically harvesting and learning so that we can evolve from that process so that, and that's going to inform this process with Tierra Sagrada. Because what, what did we do basically that didn't work well? <laughs> like, why did this happen? How could it have happened? And and what can we learn as we move forward? So, so um, yeah, just to, to add that this is this is happening on top of that. It's like that learning is now, now we can harvest that learning for it to do this a lot better. And that learning is going to take place through our Territorial Foundation in the specific neighborhood where that land was basically became like a private land grab from a rich guy in California. Um, so he took a community project, lied, spread lots of misinformation, initiated aggressive lawsuits, and now he's building his house, his little private refuge on the strategic land that was supposed to be the ecoversity. So we're also gonna do it within the community there and then within the community writ large. So we're, we have a multi-layered learning process that is unfolding in parallel with this fundraising that we're gonna do. So yeah, so there's a lot to be said about that. Um, I mean, I, I have a question maybe uh, around what Penny said that we're, we're really, as of this morning, we're sort of going deeper into a lot of clarity from things that have just happened. So my question would be, um, 
like if you were in our shoes, what would you do? You know, like who who would you talk to? Would you just be like, I can't do that? Would you be like, who should I talk to? You know, how would you handle your own inner turmoil? Like, are we crazy? Like, is this a stupid idea? Should, aren't we already doing too much? Should we really be doing like, you know, so if I was to ask you like, okay, if you were in my position, where you're like, okay, so I'm supposed to, I have all these relationships and responsibilities. Now I got to raise this money. Like, how would you feel? What does that bring up? Because this inner part is such a big part of the work. So, so let me just ask that back to you and see what comes up. All right. I'm just going to talk for one second here. Um, what what I find funny about the money work is how resistant people are to getting money, because even in my small little challenge of trying to get people to participate in the small, tiny verbs grants for just like a hundred bucks a month or one hundred fifty dollars a month of grant money to do something around your local community. I have yet to have anyone in the in the school actually apply, which to me is insane, considering it's such a small amount of money to work with. And their requirements are so minimal. So I feel this disconnect or, I mean, the ultimate, uh, for me, speed bump seems to be getting people to be willing to accept money, which was just going back to Penny's point about the reciprocity part of, uh, you know, feeling the responsibility to have to deliver once you get the money. And what does that actually mean? And if it's not something that's um, so easily reportable, you know, because there's no like super easy way to report uh, regeneration on a really small scale or something like that, even um, getting people to uh, try to raise hundreds of thousands of dollars and be willing to take the risk and put themselves out there like that um, seems like an even bigger challenge to overcome. Right. Because I'm even looking at that right now. I'm looking at my little tiny project of, you know, where I spend a thousand dollars on a piece of land. But then um, I was speaking with Maria, Marie Savvy, who's over, I think, in the Mediterranean region. And she was like, well, how do we buy the remaining 70,000 acres? And how do we raise the money for that? And I'm like, I don't even want to ask somebody for $1,000, you know, and I'm okay with receiving $100 a month right now. That seems like reasonable to me. So I, I don't know how do we overcome that because like your ask for hundreds of thousands of dollars doesn't seem unreasonable right? Seems very reasonable. And, and uh, Maria, is it Maria Elena who started the, the, uh, the, the school in France or the, the, that project? I feel like she really knows how to raise some money and get it, get things going on the ground. That's who I want to talk to, you know what I mean? And pick her brain on, on fundraising stuff too. But you guys have the most experience. And so I was hoping to get some ideas from you guys, from you guys today, you know, because I feel like there's a lot of us who, even speaking, because I'm obviously you see me attending all these other bioregional meetings and none of them want to approach the funding one besides, say, Cascadia, because they've been doing it so long. And I feel like they're already just kind of like in the flow of getting money. And all of the other ones seem to be very, very hesitant to even, you know, we're no we're nowhere near being ready. But even asking for that small little, say, hundred dollars a month to just fund the little exploration work or buy some uh, snacks to have a meetup you know, and do some work like seems to be a, um, a hurdle to overcome. So anyway, that's, um, yeah, I'm going to, that's it. That's all I've got right now. Well, I actually think you hit yeah. on something really important. Oh, Penny, you want to talk? Go ahead. Just, to, just to say, I think that that is, <laughs> it's something that we've been running into actually across all, all this work, the in body char itself, also in in the organize even the organizers in other bio regions, it's because uh, if you think about the organizers at bio regional scales, think about the responsibility of of like if you receive money and then you need to deliver on organize helping organize a bio region. <laughs> That's like what? nobody even knows how to do that yet. We're we're all learning. And like the, that is like, can actually crush somebody. I mean, we've seen it, that that kind of responsibility can shut somebody down. So uh, this is huge. And it, even at the smaller scale, you know, like you're saying it, the ability to, to receive, and then uh, first just the ability to receive, that's a, a trauma thing. And then, then the ability to actually follow through with what you're saying you're going to do and, or at least attempt it. That's huge. So 
I think what you're naming is one of the biggest, one of the biggest challenges with, with money. It's not really money. It's the responsibility, you know? Yeah. Um, before I go to Lena, I'll just say one thing, you know, how do you feel in your body when someone gives you a compliment, you know, like, Oh, I feel awkward and I deflected it. You're like, Oh, there it is. That's where the work is right there. Um, it's super important. It's so basic. Um, and Lena, over to you. Um, I just feel what's coming up here is, is there must be a lot of trauma work here, right, Penny? <laughs> because it's, you know, like asking for money um, and the other part that, that you're talking about, the responsibility when you have uh, received the money and the uh, I can feel all sorts of stuff coming up inside me, like shame and guilt, and who am I to ask for money? And how can I, you know, how can I ask for money in a way that is free from uh, coming from a trauma place? And uh, the word that comes to me now when I'm saying this out loud is like something like intention. Feel like that to create this flow of receiving that there, there must be something there. Um, because I think energetically, when 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 uh, there is fr free flow energetically, the the money should flow to me. So it's like I need to get out of my own way, sort of. Mm -hmm. yeah so that would be my input thank you thank Amy. you very very insightful asha over to you hi guys uh sorry i just waltzed in like five minutes ago so i might be saying stuff that you've talked about before or whatever um i used to raise money in the past a long long time ago uh, working in charity, raising money, and it's really hard for all the reasons that you've just said in the last five minutes. And I really, you know, second what Lena just said. Um, and so I guess there's, you know, that part of of doing our own inner work, healing, you know, working with the energy, and also recognizing that it's there is the first thing. Um, I think there's a, an important part about, I just heard you as I came in, Joe, say about, you know, how would you feel if you had all this responsibility? What would it be like in your body and stuff? So I know, I mean, in my own, I can only speak from my own experience, but, you know, it feels really heavy. It feels really scary. It feels really overwhelming. It's like, what am I doing, you know, with all of this and, and whatever? So there's something about that, that responsibility, that accountability being distributed. So it's not just in one person doing it right and I'm going to say something that might sound so flipping obvious that it feels really rude and it's really not intended like that if we don't ask so turn the you know it's really hard to receive part on its head if we don't ask then that flow never happens because we're stagnating the flow right so it was one of my first kind of real jobs with like a real salary and scary anyway and I was asked to move a small charity that you know really wanted to grow in terms of what it was able to do and, and all the rest of it and move it into new premises without a budget and I was like what the, what the you know almost in London as well right so how am I supposed to do this and I just sat down with a few people that you know were perhaps more extrovert and, and confident and, you know, had no problem with asking and just kind of try to play with it in myself and whatever. And then when we did ask, we were so astonished, you know, talking about repre, I can't even ever say the word, uh, the reciprocal flow, repre, well, I'm not going to try. So the, you know, the fact that things flow, flow in circles. And, and if, when we give, you know, we're not going to, it's not a transaction. I'm not going to give to you, Joe, and you're going to give back to me. I'm sure you will. But, you know, in that sense, it's like, I'm going to give to Beans and then Beans is going to give to Lenny and Lenny's going to give to Joe and it goes around the circle, right? So I think it's, you know, you have, this community has so much to offer. And I say that as somebody hates being online. <laughs> when I've been online, I don't know how many hours this week and quite a lot of it's been with you guys. So it's great. Um, and, you know, long may that continue, but jokes apart. Um, 
you know, there is so much to offer and, and the right people, when we're doing that, collectively doing that healing of all the stuff that makes it really difficult for us to ask for money, I have no doubt it will flow. And I think there are plenty of examples if we sort of sat down and thought about the people that we know, either in regeneration or something that's sort of, you know, related to things that are important to us and see how they're raising money. And yes, okay, then there's a game if it's grants and, you know, whatever, it depends how you want to do it. But I'm sure that that's possible, can create that flow. This mm. is what comes to, if we don't ask, we don't get. Thank you, Asha. Um, I want to share one of the places that I draw from conceptually for all of this kind of work, which is to compare what we're doing to a romantic relationship, like dating or something, asking someone out. Because, you know, there's this awkward developmental stage when we're teenagers where we seek intimacy, but we fear rejection. And so it's that exact place. And, you know, it doesn't have to be romantic. It's just where you seek intimacy and you fear rejection. That is a very important place for us to do this healing work. Um, because that's a very important place where the kind of flow of relationships happens. And Penny was observing with Elise, like, because we still co-sleep with Elise, we're in the same bed with her, and she's almost eight years old. She'll decide when she wants her own bed. And Penny was like, Elise is so comfortable giving and receiving touch. She just like crawls all over you because she has a healthy uh, developmental attachment to touch. So she'll be able to give and receive love. And so, um, so there's something about this that's just really important. I want to name that into the space and then pass it to Aletta. So you were asking what comes up in my body and I was reminded of one of the possibly only occasion in which we actually received funding into our cooperative. And I, I immediately asked myself, well, why did it actually succeed? And there were two elements to it. The one was um, the narrative, the story that was inspiring people that they wanted to actually support this on the one hand. But on the other hand, it was that we really had our ducks in a row in terms of having all the paperwork, you know, it was properly constituted, the organization was compliant, we could demonstrate that we knew how to handle the funding, that we had the people in place, that we had this, you know, so we could really put it in front of them and, and say, you know, you can be comfortable giving us this money because you can see that it's going to work, you know. And so uh, if I, I think that you've got everything, you know, in place, you just need to, to do it. You've got the story, you've already been doing it. It's just a matter of putting it out there. I think what you said about that sort of operational readiness, like, like we can, yeah, we can operationalize this. You know, we're just waiting for the flow to start. Um, I think that's a really big deal. And that's such an insight for how entrepreneurship works. Because like, if you're going to do something creative and new, you need to have a good idea, but then you actually have to be able to do it. And that's where most people fail. Lots of great ideas for people that don't know how to do it. And how to do it is sometimes, here's the bank account. This is how I'm going to pay that person. Here's the way I'm going to contract it. Like, oh, you actually know what you're talking about. It's a big deal. So thank you for that, Aletta. I think it's a huge insight. Rita, over to you. Very interesting conversation. Here I sit in a watershed that has over... Well, co probably close to 100 billionaires li living in the region. And so uh, uh, the, the package, the pitch, the reciprocal opportunities for people, you've got that track record and you can put that all together. And I think it's a kind of looking into um, Bloomberg's um, list okay who's here who has the capacity just to do it who has the heart in by regional regeneration who are those folks and um, I, th I think they're going to be easy to identify and to to pull out of the woodwork there's a project here in the valley that uh, people would love to see happen the price tag is 150 million dollars um so three hundred and fifty thousand dollars is nothing, Joe. <laughs> Go for it. 
<laughs> with blessings. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, Rita. Um, one thing I'll say is I actually think we need something more like $2 million because we need a, we need to have the capacity to start organizing land and funding people to do five-year economic transitions to move to agroforestry systems and stuff like that. But I think this $350,000 sits in that story very nicely. And that our Territory Foundation could receive and manage that scale of money. Even though it's new and it doesn't have the track record, we as a team have the track record um, and that's very easy to demonstrate. Lena, over to you. Thank you. Um, I, I think it, if it were me I'd, and I didn't know where the money should come from, I would, I would also have some um, magic touch to it or, you know, like, imaginary touch to it so that I could, I think I would want to add that um, that money could come from places I can't even imagine, you know, like to try to be really, really open. Because I have also experienced that sometimes in life where I needed money and I really didn't know where it from where it should come, and then I had it from places I didn't imagine. Yeah, I have a story that's not about money, but when I was in high school, I worked at a fast food restaurant, and one of the things I would do is sweep and mop the floors. And so I'm like an 11th grader, I think I'm like 17 years old, and I'm there sweeping the floor at the entrance, and my fifth grade science teacher comes in. And I haven't talked to him in a long time. And he's retired. He's not at the school anymore. And he comes over and says, Joe, I wanted to tell you something. Back in fifth grade, when you were in my class, I was joking one day and I said something. And I know I, know I hurt your feelings. And I just want to say I didn't mean to and I was sorry. Five minutes later, I'm in the back of the restaurant crying. Something healing in me I didn't even know was there. Didn't even know was broken. This gift came out of nowhere. This guy walks in and says something to me as I'm sweeping the floor. And I think it's that kind of, it comes from where you never could have seen it coming from. Um, it's real and it's profound because it's already out there looking for you. It's sort of like this guy was wanting to heal something in himself. And I didn't know he was looking for that until, and he was probably like, you know, around 70 years old and he comes into this 17 year old kid with a broom. Um, but uh, but yeah, I think like beans when you talked about reconnecting with your dad, it's like you know they didn't see it coming, right? Um, so I think what you're talking about, Lena, is really really powerful. Uh, so just fully acknowledging it, uh, and then over to you, Ricardo. Thank you, Joe. Um, um, I would like to know when when we are talking about the agreements, uh, these reciprocity agreements. Uh, I had to, you know, like give them a shape, right? It's like, for instance, if someone, you know, decides to uh, give a donation of a thousand dollars, in in and and the the space of the reciprocity is uh, education. It's it's um. There's a way he's, he's getting, you know, something different than uh, a person that makes a thousand dollars. You know what I mean? It's like just to to frame it in a real way. Is it important for you at this moment in time? Uh, am I being clear? I think so, because one of the things, we're, we have a meeting with Felipe next week, and our focus will be on clarifying how we create the agreements around reciprocity with donors in preparation for starting to do the work on how do we create reciprocity agreements with land stewards. Uh, like, you're going to work with uh, campesinos and, and El Pino. They may not sell their land, but they make money. What, you know, not just getting money, what are the reciprocity and what are they giving? And what, you know, and so, so we'll move to that, which in some ways is more subtle, 
um, because the local context, as you know, Ricardo, been in Santander, you know how subtle these relationships really are. I would say that initially we do it in a permaculture way, which is we cultivate an ethic of care for all of the relationships that are in our ecosystem. So if a donor arrives to us, we have to figure out, actively explore, what is the healthy relationship with this person? And we might have some heuristics, we might have some like starting points to suggest, but really we need to have a way of finding the right relationship instead of our, and you know, like the example would be, you gave a hundred dollars, you get a free copy of the book, you know, like where you could have like a standard one, which is not relational. Yeah. This is, I'd go the other way. It's like, I don't care if you only gave a hundred dollars, what is our relationship? It's like the amount of money is secondary to the fact that the relationship matters, regard, the, the relationship matters regardless of the amount. Um, and also the person that gave $100 may come back and give $100,000 because we don't know who they are yet. We don't know if they're capable of that. And so it's, and this, notice I'm not doing that, you know, customer service strategy to try and get the money. This is the, very much the opposite. What is, someone showed up, they need something. What do they need? and having that service mind, mindset toward the donors. Um, and then what I think will start to happen is our donors will do that with other donors. Like, let's say that you gave $1,000 to Bodhichara, but now you're gonna do that with your friend as they show up. You're like, well, for me, this is what I needed, but I wanna understand what you need so I can help be sure that Bodhichara gives that to you. It'll turn out that our donors will be doing that for other people as we, because this is, this is why we, when Felipe heard us talking and he said, let's focus on reciprocity, because if we get reciprocity right, this can actually be transformative because it's cultural transformation and it starts in the relationships, which is why- so, so that, yeah. that, that, that relationship will be built between, you know, the donor and the, I mean, it's, it's active, development of that relationship, right? Yeah. But it's one-to-one, -one, really, it's one-to-one. -one. It's not, you know, set through an institution. It's... Yeah, it's like if someone really loves what we're doing in Casa Comun and they fund the work that's happening there, maybe they come to Barichara and they meet Margarita and Felipe and the other people that are, this is a different Felipe, a lot of Felipe's in Colombia. Um, but, you know, they meet the people who are doing it and they're like, wow. And they show up and they maybe someone shows up and says, I'm really looking for healing around decolonization. You know, I have such guilt about what my ancestors have done. I need healing. And then I'm talking to Margarita who knows, you know, she's like, go to Corazoma, sit in there, Maloka, meet Gabriela. She will help you with that healing process. And they've honored the reciprocity for that person. And they didn't know that Margarita would connect them to Gabriella, would connect them to Corazoma, because they didn't know any of those relationships yet. But if we've made it clear that healing is one of the ways that they get reciprocity, then the donor is already asking themselves, how do they show up? You know, what am I seeking when I come to Bodhichara? And this is the kind of person that maybe could afford to fly here and pay their own way. And they've given a more, in their mind, something more substantial if, you know, the amount of money is is relative to what Beans thinks is a lot of money is not the same thing that Bill Gates thinks is a lot of money. So the word significant here is very, very contextual. Um, but that it's if it's significant to them, then the reciprocity is significant to them too. And that's why this reciprocity, the focus on reciprocity opens up a pathway of transformation, interpersonal transformation. Um, and which is why when Felipe said that, we're like, lots of ideas start coming in, into our heads. Okay, the only comment I have on the reciprocity end of it would be something that I saw when I was watching a previous uh, regenerative finance lab that um, uh, I believe it was Brian mentioned about, um, I think it was more of like a time banking thing about the fairness, right? And I feel like it's a big problem too with the quote unquote fairness problem. Not that the idea of needing reciprocity, not that we shouldn't just 
do something reciprocal because we want to because they gave but the expectation of receiving when giving is a huge problem in my opinion and not that you shouldn't maybe expect something even at a minor level but yeah at the same time you should not be giving to expect something in return or am i just thinking of some weird old antiquated way of thinking because obviously we're raising money and not just giving to give for for no reason i guess um, but I feel like the expecting reciprocity is almost a problem, but it is a culture thing too, that how do we get over that? Yeah, I would say the expecting reciprocity is not from the giver, it's from the receiver. The receiver should expect to reciprocate. And the place where we experience this most profoundly in Bari Chara, there's this amazing woman named Emil Say. She's just truly phenomenal. And I found a donor who gave $10,000 to a project of hers which is this community theater. And the $10,000 built this beautiful roof for this community theater. And Emil Say did not know the person who gave the money. And Emil Say felt more and more uncomfortable not knowing. She's basically someone that I don't know that lives in Maryland in the United States gave $10,000. All I know is that Joe told me it's a woman with a child who cares about education. And that it's someone who's traumatized. So that's all Joe told me. So Emil Say does not know this person. And Emil Say started having problems sleeping at night because here her life's dream of this community theater is being manifested by a woman who's a parent who is traumatized and suffering living in, in North America. And Emil Say realized she has to give something to this person. And so she asked me, um, if she wrote a letter and she had her husband helped her translate it into English, would I send it to this person? And she wrote a letter asking this person what she would like in healing at any time in her life to come back to Bari Chara and Emil Say would gather the healers. Emil Say, who doesn't speak English, would find the way to do this. And it was because Emil Say felt her life dream being manifested almost like by a faceless lover who needed a face. And so the one receiving knows that they're giving, but the one giving doesn't know that they must receive. And so in a way, we're sort of reversing that expectation. It's that they're receiving somehow, but if like you give money to placate your guilt, like I have this yacht and this big boat, you know, this, this like, you know, private jet and these mansions, I feel guilty. So here's a hundred thousand dollars. Now I'm going to go back into drinking heavily. You're like, well, you just blocked yourself from receiving what you needed. And so it was from that sort of indigenous place that Emil Say showed us. This was more than a year. This was like almost two years ago. Emil Say felt like she had to give back to this person she didn't know. It turned out the person she gave to was so traumatized she couldn't receive. And so the reciprocity didn't happen fully, but it happened enough for Emil Say to be able to sleep at night. And it was Emil Say's wisdom that showed us how necessary this was. And so, so that's, that's, I think your, your question and your comment is super important because it reveals that the place of healing is that the energy has got to flow for there to be a wholesome relationship, but how it flows is very particular to the relationship. But the fact that it doesn't complete its flow means it's not healthy. And if we're going to have true regenerative pathways, this is one of those touch points is that where money flows, there has to be healing or there has to be wholesomeness, maybe I should say. Um, and it was Emil Say who saw it, Aletta. Yeah, I also think this is a key, key thing because often I think people that are giving money and there is no flow, there's no reciprocity, there is de facto a power play in there. You know, because the, because the person receiving the money is disempowered, you know, like like the example that you gave, you know, she didn't know how to respond or who to respond to. So, um, yeah, there, there must be a pathway. Otherwise, you get into power dy dynamics in my experience. Yeah, this is where that energy stagnation leads to violence. The violence can be completely unintentional. It could be structural. So, yeah, exactly as you said, Asha. I think there's something else. Care is a flow as well, no? Mm. So the fact that, that uh, you know, 
people fund stuff because they care. Look at the example you just gave, Joe. You know, somebody that maybe didn't have a whole lot in her situation, but had enough that she wanted to give to something that she really cared about because it was really meaningful for her. The, the example you just gave with the woman in, in the States you know, with giving 10 grand. Um, I think, uh, I, I don't know them directly, really the kind of people I frequent, but I have, you know, people in my kind of extended network who have the sort of money that Rita is, is you know, speaking to in, in Aspen. Um, and they all want to do really useful things. They are quite collapse aware. They might not be collapse accepting or whatever. They're aware. They want to do stuff. They don't know where to put it. And I, for example, I know somebody who helps them, you know, choose where they should put it. And they are, I hate the word, but they're looking for impact, right? Okay, they, you know, they might also be looking for return on their money, those particular individuals or whatever, but they're looking for things that they really care about. That's my point, you know? If all of this community is activating in some way, we find a process to, you know, do some of the inner work and and put that signal out, let's say, in lots of different ways, through stories, through all the great things that this community has to offer. I'm sure that we can attract people who care about the work that's being done here, who are not looking for more money because they really don't need it. And the right people will come. I know that feels so easy to say, and somehow quite so difficult to do. And maybe it's just not that difficult to do. And the care is is a really key activator, maybe, no? Because lots of people care. Trauma is in, also in all of those people and aspirin and wherever, right? It's not just in those of us who, who you know, in the world who are who don't have. So it's 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 a huge opportunity for that care to be spread. I don't know if that makes any sense, but it's just what I'm feeling. Yeah, I think it's actually really powerful. Um, we have two things that, that we're doing right now that I think are going to help with the story. Actually, I'd maybe even say three. We're having the kinds of conversation we're having right now, where more of us through the design school are coming into this kind of awareness together not just like, oh, Aleta has it on her own. Aleta has it while well, Lena has it. We're having it together. And that's creating a different energetic signal for how things arrive to any of us, not just the, to arrive to body chart. And that is happening in the field, at a field level. Then also um, the work here in body chart, I'm starting to do more proactive storytelling, like the blogging on the Regenerate Body Chara website and um, and the recordings like this one that I'll make public. And even if not very many people see them, the right one or two people seeing it at the right moment is all it takes. And so it's this interesting way that that energetic attractor creates small nudges in the right direction. And then the surprises, as Lena said, the surprises come from somewhere you didn't see. And then the third thing is that next Tuesday is the full moon. And on the full moon, we publish the Bioregional Earth newsletter. And... Brian and Susan have been working with us, with their third um, silent partner, Douglas, um, to create the Bioregional Earth website. And we're gonna publish it with that newsletter next Tuesday. And that new the Bioregional Earth website is gonna tell the story of how we become a Bioregional Earth. And it's gonna have a page for the design school and a page for the Earth Regeneration Fund. And people are gonna start to see the big story. Now, again, there are only a thousand people on the email list. It's not like we're going to huge numbers. But the story is already out there. It's already moving. And this is going to help create a landing place for the story to be coherent. And so these are just concrete examples of you scaffold the story in its various ways. And what we want to do is help huge amounts of money through mycelial networks to move to huge diversities of local places, which will mostly be fairly small amounts of money in each flow. But if we're gonna move like, you know, $500 billion or something that's, think of the scale that the planet needs, like we need, you know, $10 trillion needs to move in a regeneration or something like that. Like, well, okay, so the only way that can happen is if the small, if the architecture of the relationship is right, regardless of the scale. And that's why focus on reciprocity is like illuminating so much for us right now. It's like, oh, if we can architect this right, or this thousand dollar donor shows up, did we architect that? Did we create clarity around that around that reciprocity? 
because then the pattern is going to be the same for a million dollar donor, you know, scaled appropriately. And, and so that's what I see is so powerful about this is if all of us are going out and thinking about reciprocity, if Baines is going out and going like, so that one person who's going to get hundred dollars a month on this thing that I do, what was the reciprocity relationship that we cultivated there? Was it a good architecture of relationship? You know, like the scale is sort of independent because it's, it's scale invariant because it's fractal, it works across scales. So just naming the significance of the pattern being right, regardless of scale, is a really big deal. Your idea about um, uh, we need more eyes on this is always my thing, right? And and then the um, reciprocity. And from what I see as being a person who you know lives on social media a lot, um, you see a lot of people who support monthly creators on YouTube by paying a tiny little subscription and that's their reciprocity and they feel really happy about having their name on the like in the end credits of the videos and so it's it's even what I'm pushing for even something like the Ogallala project is where they do a little bit more of recording of what they're actually doing on the ground so the reciprocity for smaller donors like say someone like me who might donate twenty dollars a month right is just getting to see the work actually being done once in a while and that enjoyment of like, cool, like I know that my $20 went to that, right? That's the inspiration that you mentioned, right? And I feel like there's a lot of money to be had in the inspiration game right now, especially on um, video type of stuff, because as you mentioned, X is a nightmare right now, right? Mm -hmm. And you really can't do anything on there. But I do notice that TikTok organizes people sort of to a point, and a lot of people are on YouTube. And if you look at things like that are doing regenerative work, like say, I always example Dust Up Ranch right now, which is in Texas. That guy raises money, has volunteers coming out to help him do his land. And all they're getting in return is like maybe their name on the end of the credits for a video or, you know, him just saying thank you for everyone that showed up, which for a lot of people is enough, but a lot of people aren't willing to even ask for that minimal amount of help. Even me, my plan is to go to the desert and ask nobody for help, which is effing stupid, right? Right. The reality is that's a stupid, that's a stupid plan. I should be willing to accept help. Right. Like, and, and there are people that will do the help on a small scale. And, and I just want to put that out there. I want to like, even in Cascadia and the greater Tacaranto bioregion, I don't see anybody putting out a lot of media of on the ground work, tying it back to the bioregionalism movement, which I think really could change a lot of things. Um, and yeah, that's where I'm at. As far as raising money on my end, if I were you, right, that would be my plan, right? Is just to go out there, bang out some easy YouTube videos because you have kids, kids that know technology, kids that can learn how to do social media, pro environmental memes, right? Editing to save the earth, all of these kinds of things that I think are super crucial in the time where we're so, uh, we're such like slaves to the algorithm that if we're not taking advantage of the algorithm ourselves, then are we just stupid? <laughs> because like, if that's where the money flow is coming from right now and where culture is changing, um, then we should be at the forefront of that and taking advantage of that as much as humanly possible. On top of taking advantage of all this stuff that like, obviously everybody in this bioregional movement has been doing for 20 plus years, 30 years, 40 years, take that little stuff. And how do we apply that to modern <clears throat> methods of marketing? Because in my opinion, like everybody wants to shop at Whole Foods, but they can't afford to, right? Like, you so it's really a marketing thing because we know that producing organic food isn't necessarily that much more expensive. <laughs> so like, it's a marketing thing. I'm always the marketing guy. Like I always come back to like, we just have bad marketing, you know? Um, anyway, that's it for me. I think really pushing on social media as like, if that's what I were to do and be in your shoes to raise hundreds of thousands of dollars. But then again, that media has to attract bigger donors because you're not going to get, you know, probably 30,000 people giving $10 a month in the first two months, right? So there's the reality that it doesn't scale quickly. Yeah, I think um, there's something that uh, my friend Zeb Harrell is from New Zealand. Um, he was uh, thinking a lot about, and he came to Body Charo and we hung out. And he's in the design school, but not very active at the moment. Um, but he, he's very active on the ground. And one of the things he talked about was, um, was bioregions, not bunkers. It was basically like, 
there are these stupid billionaires creating bunkers as if that's anything like like the transhumanist and they're just like they don't even get how sick they are to think that's a good idea and um and it's like well actually uh you know if if someone invested in a regional food system in the south island of new zealand rather than building a stupid bunker they would actually have built a bunker like something that actually creates security a food system and they probably would have saved money <laughs> um, probably wouldn't have cost them as much as their stupid bunker uh because you know if you look at the things that jeff bezos and mark zuckerberg and stuff they're spending a lot of money on bunkers that are pretty stupid and so uh, so there's something really profound about this. And I feel like the key is going to be, really, it's all about relationships. And um, like one of the things Penny said to me last night was, I, I won't name the person, but there was someone that we know that, um, that some of you know, um, but someone that we know that has an inheritance and feels really guilty about it. They donated $25,000 to our work in Centropic Agriculture at the very beginning. And they thought about maybe moving to Bodhichara and they could be one of those sanctuary people. They could actually live here and be in the community and it'd be okay. And they could probably give up to the level of $100,000, $150,000, which means they could buy this piece of land with us in the Bioparque. So Penny was like, my first impulse is maybe we should just have a really earnest conversation with that person. And it's like, you know, maybe we should. It's like, um, sometimes what we need is the the getting over the hump in a sense of like there's this resistance barrier and what we need to do is just say well you know like if we had a hundred and fifty thousand dollar win in our three hundred fifty thousand dollar fundraise the rest of the story sure does sound easier now doesn't it you know and so like we're already secured the land woohoo so it's like that kind of thing and um and i think there's something about just like you know lena said what would i need to do to ask someone for money and, but not in this like weird manipulative way, in a genuine way. It's like, if I ask Beans to come and help me, it's not like I'm asking to manipulate. It's like, I got a friend who's got a back and arms and muscles and could do something. Yeah, they could come pick up that box and carry it. You know, asking a friend to help you move is a good example of that, you know, like, um, but I think it's so important. And I see also that we're at our time and I wanna honor that. And what I wanna ask for us moving forward. And so I just want to ask you to hold this question. How, you know, how is this reciprocity conversation landing in you? You know, just, what's it doing inside of you? What are you feeling? What, where, where, where does it help your healing edge? Whether it comes back to the fundraising and body chart or not, just where does it help your healing edge and where you are? Because I think we all got to get better at giving and receiving, um, all of us, me included. You know, it's period, full stop. So um, so thank you for what's been a really beautiful conversation. I'm going to make the recording public. So once it's out, you guys can share it with any friends you want. Um, and, you know, if you know someone wants to give $150,000 to Body Char, I'll welcome them over. Uh, and let's, you know, or whatever, or 20 bucks a month. Um, and let's play together. Let's see how we can make all this happen for all of us. So... Thank you for a beautiful conversation today. Mm.